um, yeah, I'm a uh, software developer at Staffbase, and I'd like you to show how you can use these little UB keys to log in over SSH. So um, we only have a 20 minute time slot, so I'll try to be quick. Um, this talk goes as follows. We're not gonna go into what SSH is. This is Linux days, I'm pretty sure you all know. Uh, but we will discuss what, uh, what Fido keys are, what, UB, what, what this UB key is. Then we'll see how we can use that with SSH. It's really easy, so we're gonna, we are going to do it live. And at the end, we discuss the two key types available because that's the most interesting configuration option. So, uh, Fido keys or you know, UB keys, as it says in the title, um, I'd first get, like to get something straight. We're gonna talk about Fido2 authenticators because um, you know, that's the correct terminology. It is vendor neutral and I mean, I'm not here to advertise any specific product, right? So um, I'm pretty sure some of you already have seen Fido authenticators. I have one here, this one is a UB key. I'll, I'll show it later on the camera so you can see it up close. Um, <clears throat> uh, usually Fido authenticators come in this, in this little USB stick form. You can have some which are built into your computer as well. But in this talk, I'm focusing on the little USB devices. They're cheap, they're quite common in my opinion already. And in fact, um, who of you owns such a device? Well, it's way more, seriously, oh, that, that's way more than I expected. Uh, and who, who of you actually uses it for anything? <laughs> oh wow, okay, okay. That, that really took me by surprise. I thought it would be like three people. Um, do I even have to do this introductory thing then? Well, I will anyway. Um, so uh, to get back to the, to the start, or to, to the basics, FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. Uh, FIDO 2 is a standard published by the FIDO Alliance. There's a couple related standards. Those of you who do web development might be um, familiar with the web authentication standard. There's also a little standard governing how the USB communication works on a hardware level. Um, and this FIDO, to, uh, this FIDO Alliance, it's an, you know, an organization of companies. Some of the founding members are PayPal and Google. And what they're trying to achieve is because of you know, where these companies are coming from, they're coming from this you know, domain of web services. And they all have lots of users and it's important to them for obvious reasons that these users can log in securely. Traditionally, they do that using passwords. I suppose I don't have to you know, explain the weak points of passwords, right? The people tend to use easy passwords, they reuse them, passwords can be stolen by phishing campaigns. And what this Fido Alliance tries to solve then is um, they wanted to create an open standard for, <coughs> for multi-factor authentication on the web. So that's where these little devices come in. As you can see in the illustration, the idea is that there is some key. Um, I'm not gonna go into the, you know, the cryptographic details. The idea is there is a key pair, public and private key. The server knows the public key. This little device has the private key. It signs some kind of crypto challenge and that is how you prove that you're in possession of this private key. And the trick now is that this private key never leaves this little device. When you create a new key pair, it's not your computer that creates the, the private key. It's this, you know, there's some kind of certified cryptography chip inside this little USB stick, and that's where the key crypt's created. And that's the only place where this key is accessible ever. So no, com uh, no program on your computer ever gets to see it. Not your browser, not some kind of virus, and not even your operating system. And that's basically how you bind an identity to a physical device. So, <coughs> it sounds quite useful, right? To get multi-factor authentication. Can we use that with SSH? I mean, yeah, the answer is yes, of course. That's why we are having this talk today. So SSH already employs something very similar. When you use SSH key files, you also use public and private <coughs> uh, key cryptography. And it would ver be very nice now if we could use a authenticator instead of that key file. And that's possible since you know early 2020, so kind of just before the coronavirus hit. Uh, they merged that feature in OpenSSH version 8.2, and we can use that to use the keys from this authenticator now. Um, but enough of the talk, I'm gonna show that now. We'll try it out. And I've prepared a little bit. Did it show? Yeah. 
I have prepared something, so for those in the back, uh, I mean, most of you actually know these YubiKeys, so you can just look at your bench neighbors, but um, yeah, that's what they look like usually, you know, some kind of simple USB stick. This one has a simple touch touch field. It can detect, you know, touches, not, not fingerprints. That also exists with some of the different products. Um, there's also products which have like keypads or something. This one just detects touches. So we'll plug it in. And what, what else I have here is there's two terminals on the right. That's, um, those are terminals on a remote machine. Um, it's, it's a completely vanilla Ubuntu server. I did not configure anything. It's just a clean, fresh installation. And on the left, you see a terminal on my own machine. So now to get a key, what we do in SSH is we call SSH Keygen with the appropriate um, command line arguments. So let's just give that file a name. We'll skip having a passphrase for the demo. We don't need that. And the interesting part is specifying the type with uh, tab completion to the rescue. Uh, we see that there are two key types with this SK suffix. And that stands for, well, I suppose secure key. It doesn't matter which one we use, it's all the same for this for this demonstration. And we generate the key now. Um, yeah, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, I have I have performed a factory reset of that UB key. So it is as if you had bought a new one. The only thing I did was set a pin, because you need a pin for some of these operations. Um, yeah, in case you're trying to watch the pin is one, two, three, four. Um, <laughs> So, and now I have to touch it. You can, you can see it blinking. We touch it, we get a key. So what does the key look like? Well, it looks suspiciously like a normal pair of key files. You know, it looks like we got the private key. It's a bit strange, right? Because I said the private key remains on that device. I'll get, get to that in a second. Um, so I'll just show that we can log in without any further configuration. So we move that um, public key to the target, to the target server. And you know, just to make sure that we can actually see something, we will uh, follow the system logs. Yeah, OK, sorry. <laughs> Demo gods are not smiling on me today. Yeah, okay. And you will. S we've we've copied the public key to the target server. You can see that in the usual place. Authorized keys. Um, if you're quick at reading, you will see that it's the same key on both sides. And we just log in now. UB key. Confirm user presence. That thing blinks again. I touch it. I'm logged in. Um, Nothing spectacular, but the point here is we didn't have to configure anything. That's what I wanted to drive home. Uh, here we just see the the keys, you know, the, the fingerprint of the public key. So let's get back to these files we saw now. Um, now, why why do we have what appears to be a private key file? Now the um, the idea why why we have that is that you might use this key or I mean you're expected to use this key with many different services so there needs to be a way you know to distinguish which of those key pairs you want to use so basically this this file this what appears to be a private key file just contains the key id or uh, you know the way fido calls it a credential id um, you know, it's, it's just a way of keeping keeping that information somewhere, and I think the SSH developers just opted to use that file because you know SSH already is meant to use command line parameters and con configuration <laughs> options, which expect files. So I'm pretty sure they just recycled that kind of. So you can see a you know it kind of points to a key on that device. So there there ought to be a way to to inspect that key, right? So let's do that next. It's possible to do this. There is a um, there is a command line utility that comes with one of the uh, Fido uh, Fido libraries. So that's vendor agnostic. Uh, the command line arguments are a bit cryptic, uh, but that's why I practice typing them. Um, and you can see it asks us for the pin, and we don't see any output. 
but perhaps it's because of the tool. Or well, there's also a tool made by the, uh, by the manufacturer of these tokens, which has a slightly nicer command line interface. And that one will show us a table which contains no lines. There's just the table headers. That's a bit weird, right? Well, but this is intentional because it turns out I, well, I didn't exactly lie to you, but I only told you half the truth. Um, because there appears to be nothing, nothing on that USB key now, right? So what is it that's, that's, in, that, that's in that file then? You know, it, because we saw it log in, right? It, it did work. So now it might be a bit confusing. That file actually contains the private key, which is the exact thing I said it, that's not the case. But there is another trick here. The point is, um, we don't have the private key as it is. We only have an intransparent encrypted blob of bytes. Because when we generated that key, it was indeed generated on this, uh, on this authenticator. And what we got as a credential ID is nothing else but the encrypted private key. So we are still bound to use this one authenticator because only this authenticator has the private key, oh, sorry, this, you know, this device master key, so nobody else can you know, do anything with that file. Now, you might be wondering why, why is it that way? Isn't it, wouldn't it have been much easier to just keep the key on that device? Yeah, um, of course, uh, we'll see that that's possible too. The idea here is when you think back, you know, what I said in the beginning that Fido is about these uh, web services, the idea is you'd you know, you'd use this with many services. So I don't, I don't know how many entries your password manager has. Mine has about 50. And these, you know, these crypto chips, they tend to have very limited storage. So um, by doing it this way, by essentially storing the private key outside the authenticator, you are free to have as many keys as you want, which, you know, that's an obvious plus. It would also allow vendors of these uh, Fido keys to create devices which don't actually have any storage, you know, which presumably would be cheaper. Um, but the downside is that now you have to, you know, you have to synchronize or like uh, back up these, these key files. Um, <coughs> that's, you know, that's one major downside. But as I said, you can, you can get what I described before because you can actually have this, this, this use case here on the top. It is called a resident key, or you know, the, the, the labels in italics are the, the, recommended, the recommended terminology for um, Fido nowadays. Nowadays they call it a discoverable credential, uh, which makes sense in the, sen uh, in the context of web, web services. But we'll go with the resident key here. And uh, so I'll just quickly demonstrate that we can do that as well. So, again, we use SSH keygen. I'll give it a name, yubikey2, skip the passphrase, um, have a type. And the one thing we add is this option resident. Uh, we, we touch the thing again, you see it blinking. We have a device, we, uh, sorry, we have a key, we copy it. Um, You'll see me log in. Um, yeah, I mean, why, why am I logging in? Oh, I've, so, I've shown you that before. The only reason why is that I want you to see that the key works and that I will now just delete it. I have no files, but I can get it recreated from that device because to use these command line tools again, um, you will see that there is a key now. It shows something. Here, this output is a bit nicer. You can see here, for example, this RPID stands for the relaying party identifier. Uh, if you used it with a web service, it would say something like, you know, Google, PayPal, Facebook, something like that. The default option here is just to use SSH. You can override that if you want. Uh, the username doesn't really make sense here. But you see there is a key saved on that device, and we can get it back using SSH key again, which got a nice new option, minus K, which you see is accessing the authenticator. And this passphrase thing here, you can ignore that. That is SSH specific. That has nothing to do with Fido. We'll skip that. And what we got is we got the key back in a, you know, a key file with the default name. And we will now log in using that key file. 
there you go, I confirm the user presence. And the interesting part now is in this log here on the bottom, you see that before I deleted the files, and right now when I logged in, the fingerprint is the same. It's the same key. That's what I wanted to show. So this way, uh, you can you can get this above the, the use case on the top here, which has the the benefit, or you know, depending on what you want to do, you can see it as a as a good or bad point. One thing it, it is enables you is, for example, to have a backup key on a physical device and lock that away in a safe, you know, without having to synchronize these uh, private key files, if that's something you desire, or you can have a key, you know, literally the keys to the kingdom, something your admins pass around from one to, one to another. If that's what you desire, you can implement it using this way, but that depends on what you're trying to achieve and what what it is that you're afraid of to use to use these keys. Um, so that concludes the talk already. Uh, there are the image credits, as usual, and with that, I thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll, I'm here to take them. Uh, does it work with any Fido2 key? Or does, does it require some something particular? Uh, sorry? It, if it works with any key which has a Fido2 uh, capability. Oh, yes, yes. It works okay. with any key that has Fido2 capabilities. That's what I tried to show mm -hmm. here. That's why I mentioned, you know, it's not important that this is a UB key. You can use Nitro keys, Titan keys, whatever. Yeah. Um, I have the GoTrust key which doesn't have a capability to store anything on it. Okay. Uh, but it still has a uh, Fido2 level. Yeah, then it should work because yeah. then if it can't store anything, what, you're what you essentially get is uh, is this previous use case uh, where basically you do the storing of the private key on your device and that key you have should just be there to sign it or like to uh, yeah, like do the crypto operations but not do the storage. Uh, unfortunately, I only have this one at the moment so I couldn't try it out but um, that's the idea. That's how it should work. There was another question. Yeah, uh, hello. Um, uh, my question is: uh, If you are in a uh, in an environment where you have like um, 100 uh, servers managed by Ansible, uh, how do you configure it so you don't need to touch the key 100 times when you play a role uh, on on all of them? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. The question was: If you do a lot of SSH accesses, like 100, you don't want to touch it 100 times. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, there is, it's possible to use SSH agent to um, somehow preload the key. I, I haven't tried that uh, because the talk's too short to present it. Uh, there is a configuration option, you know, when I passed, um, you know, when, when I passed this option to SSH key again. Um, here this... Yeah, uh, no touch required, probably. The, yeah, exactly. Somebody said that, yeah. There's an option saying no touch required. Uh, the only difference is you have to actually specify that on the server side as well, because by default the server would not accept such yeah, a credential. Yeah, that's exa exactly what we did, but uh, it definitely uh, lowers the security impact a, a, a bit. Uh, so I was just wondering whether there is some workaround to how, how to do it without without. Uh, uh, the no, flag no, I'm, I'm not aware that there would be anything yeah. else you could do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to ask about the non-discoverable keys because uh, with the resident you can you can pull them out from the keys memory. But uh, if I have the non-resident key and I lose it, could I then then like generate a new one from the same key and then use it like f uh, with the servers? Would that work? Uh, no. Like the idea generally is that exactly this should not work because they should be bound to this physical device. Uh, because there are. No, 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 I'm, I'm asking uh, about the same key. I would use the same key, but I, 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 for, I lost the files on the computer. Oh, okay, that's what you mean. Um, yeah, well, no. If you like, if you have this on the bottom, this this non-resident key, and you use, you lose the file. Yeah. Yeah. Then the private key is lost. Then that's it. <laughs> you have to create a new one. Okay. Thank you. I actually, hello, I actually have a solution for the question before. Uh, SSH has a function for this called Control Master, also known as SSH Multiplexing. Uh, you can enable it in your config, in your home. Contro uh, it's the option Control Master, you set it to Auto, and then you, uh, then you put uh, 
control persist and you set a number of seconds for which a multiplex connection should persist after you disconnect. So instead of uh, losing one of the main uh, secure or one of the very significant security advantages of using uh, FIDO2 uh, authenticators, which is uh, physical presence verification. Uh, you can set this, and uh, after your Ansible uh, SSH client essentially disconnects, you may set it uh, to you know keep the connection sort of open in the background without actually doing anything for uh, as long as you want, and then it will disconnect first of all much quicker, which is for which is what it was uh, originally designed for, and uh, without asking you for the for the verification of the presence again. That is interesting, but doesn't it only work if you try to access the same target server again? Uh, same server, well, dip. Because if you access, like in this Ansible case uh, he mentioned, you would be accessing a different server every time. Oh, for different servers, well, then it might depend on, I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure there was some it depends on how you access the servers. If you access them through some sort of proxy, then it would work. Okay, and there were there were use cases for this, but no. In general, if they're like completely unrelated servers, then no. But uh, if you reconnect it to to it multiple times, in, in that case, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, but still an interesting thought. Yeah. Maybe that's something you know. It's a fairly yeah. obscure obscure option, so it might help. It, there's another question on the top. Yeah. Hello, uh, I have a question concerning to backups. Basically, you want keys to be have a, have a copy. So is there a way how to synchronize the keys either in the first case when there is a master key inside the token or the residential key that can be copied into two physical keys? Uh, well, not, not, in a, not as a general solution, but as far as I know, the Fido Alliance allows the vendors to specify some kind of vendor-specific synchronization mechanism. Um, because what they are trying to achieve nowadays is actually that you wouldn't use these uh, keys as a second factor, but that you would use the FIDO authenticators as the only means of identifying yourself. And you know, th then it would be really bad if that was the only thing you know, holding your identity and you just, yeah, like, it gets stolen or you lose it. Um, that's why they're uh, why they allowed having a some kind of vendor specific solution to that? Well, well, the solution to that is to use GPG keys inside that because you can generate the GPG keys, do a backup, copy it into one key, restore the backup, copy it to the other key. Yeah, okay, that that would be another solution. Uh, that these UB keys also support uh, uh, GPG functionality, uh, but that's like not true of all the FIDO authenticators. But you're right, that is the the way of using these UB keys with SSH that existed before FIDO support, but you know, as it was only 20 minutes, uh, we it, didn't go into that. It's a general recommendation by yeah. all the manufacturers to have at least two keys so you're not lost. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Well, then, thanks again for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.